a frontier, any frontier, there can be little margin for error. Just as the first covered wagons making their way across the American desert had a finite supply of food and water, so too on this even vaster frontier are there laws that must be strictly observed. Thomas Barton has been piloting emergency dispatch ships for five years. He has never been faced with this particular law of the frontier until now. Thomas Barton is about to discover firsthand that there are limits, even here, in the boundless reaches of the Twilight Zone. Computational error, unauthorized payload. Computational error, unauthorized payload. Fuel supply insufficient for mission completion at present mass. I said, come out of there. All right, hold it right there. Right there. All right, come out real slow. Come on. Come on. All right. I give up. Look, I know I shouldn't have done this. Who are you? I was going to Mimir uh, for the linguistics academy there. And then I heard JDS was going to Woden, so I... You see, my brother, Jerry, he, uh, he works on Woden, on the government survey team there, and it's been five years since I've seen him. I haven't seen him since he left Earth. You see, it was just sort of the two of us growing up, and, well, I knew it'd be like a year before I'd see him again. <laughs> five years is a long time, you know? I've missed him. And I know I shouldn't have stowed away, but I just, I, I didn't want to wait another year. I knew I'd be breaking some sort of regulation another look. I'm not a freeloader. I can pay for my own keep once we get to work. And I've got a Class B computer license, and my background is in linguistics, so that might be useful. This is nice. What's your name? Marilyn. Marilyn Lee Cross. My brother's Jerry Cross. Do you know? No, I don't. Are we going faster? Yeah, I shut off the uh, engines that were decelerating us as we moved into Woden's star system. I'm trying to save a little fuel for a little while. Why? Stardust, this is EDS 34G11. Barton speaking, priority blue. I need to speak with Commander Delhart immediately. Are you gonna. Priority blue acknowledged, Barton. Patching you in. Are you gonna ask them to come back for me? Don't! Barton, what seems to be the problem? Commander Delhart, we have a stowaway on board. I see. I assume you follow standard procedures. Negative, sir, I have not. Commander Delhart, the situation is a little unusual here. The stowaway isn't a criminal or a smuggler. She's a girl. What? Yes, sir, a teenager. She wants to see her brother in Woden. She didn't even know what she was doing. Oh. Commander Delhart, is there another cruiser in the area? A freighter or, or another scout ship? No, you're too far out. We're the only ship within 40 light years. What about sending out another EDS? It would never reach you on time. What about a ground to space transport from Woden? Anything at all, sir? No, I'm sorry. There's absolutely no possibility of intercept. There's just nobody out there to help. Martin, I'm sorry. I... I wish to God there was something I could do, but there isn't. You do understand that, don't you? What does he mean? Yes, sir, I understand. I'll get ship's records to call you so we can make the necessary notifications. Delhart out. Are you going to tell me what he means? The ship is carrying serum for call of fever. Back to Group 1 on Woden. Their base was hit by a meteor storm. Their supply was wiped out. Do you know what call of fever is? 
No. It's like meningitis. It's quicker and more painful. Group two, where well, your brother is, is actually 8,000 miles away across the Western Sea from group one. So there's no way they can get back to group one in time to help, which means 35 men are going to die unless the ship with a serum reaches them on schedule. I see. So I, uh, I'm throwing you off the yes. schedule? EDS, this is ship's records. EDS. This is EDS, I acknowledge. We'll need all the data on the subject's identification disk. One moment, please. I see your identification disk. ID number T837-Y41, name Marilyn Lee Cross, date of birth July 7th, 2040, place of birth Grand Rapids, Michigan, American Commonwealth, Earth. Original destination. Port City, Beamer. Time of execution. What? What does she mean? At what time was the stowaway ejected from the ship? I'll inform you later. Ejected? She can't be serious. Now listen to me. It's my fault because I should have told you as soon as I found you. And I thought maybe, oh, maybe once I contacted Delhart, Delhart could do something about it. I don't know. If you eject me, I'll die. I, I realize that. Warning. Fuel supply insufficient for mission completion. Moving to condition yellow. <laughs> Nobody wants you to die, and nobody would ever let it be this way if there was anything humanly possible they could do to change it, but there's not. I mean, these emergency dispatch ships are given just exactly enough fuel to get to their destination, maybe a little extra to allow for atmospheric turbulence. But my added weight will cause it to lose its fuel before we reach the ground. Yeah, it'll crash, and you and I will die, and so will 35 people waiting for the serum. What about the Stardust? Can it come to pick me up? No. God, it's carrying medical supplies and food to the outer colonies. And hundreds of people will die if it doesn't reach its destination on schedule. You talk like this happens every day, you know? Just like you're throwing some excess baggage overboard. You don't think I'm going to have to live with this for the rest of my life? I mean, every night when you come to me in my dreams, don't you think if there was something, anything I could do to help you, I would do it? Entering Woden gravitational vector phase one. Engine ignition must occur at T minus 85 minutes. Mass must be reduced. It's all just numbers, isn't it? Ratios. Equations. It's nothing personal, it's just, uh, it's just mathematics. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. It is just mathematics. I mean, H amount of fuel won't power this ship safely to its destination with M plus X amount of mass. It's as simple as that. X. It's me, isn't it? The unwanted factor in a mathematical equation. I can go alone, or I can take 35 others with me. In case you're wondering, the EDS doesn't have any sophisticated landing computers. I mean, I mean, you can't pilot the ship by yourself. I know. <laughs> Thanks for the thought, though. <laughs> Isn't there anything else? You know, a jettison? These things are designed pretty lean. I mean, there's hardly an extra kilogram.
what's left. Well, we'll soon find out. the engines and start deceleration by 1900 hours. That's less than an hour. Oh God, how did this happen so fast? It's different out here. I mean, it's not like Earth. The frontier is so vast that there's no margin for error out here. I mean, you make a mistake, there's nobody can help you. Entering Woden gravitational vector. Phase two engine ignition must occur at T minus 75 minutes. Do you want to talk to him? Your brother, do you want to talk to your brother? I think we're within range now. Yes. EDS 34G11 to group two on Woden, please copy. Group two, Woden, we copy EDS. Jerry Cross, please, is urgent. Jerry? No, he went out on a reconnaissance mission. He won't be back for a while yet. Over. Please notify him as soon as possible, then signal us. It's urgent. EDS out. It seems to go faster all the time, doesn't it? I just want to hear his voice. I think when I hear his voice, I'm... I won't be so scared. It's cold in here. Is it cold? No, it's, uh... Yeah, it's colder than it should be here. Maybe, uh... Maybe I shouldn't... Wait, you know, maybe... Maybe I'm just being selfish. Maybe it would be better for Jerry if, if uh, you, you told him afterward. No. No, that's not what he'd want. He'd want you to wait. Is it getting dark where he is? I've heard everyone I love. I've been so stupid, so selfish. It wasn't your fault. It really wasn't your fault at all, and they'll understand that. I'll never be able to tell them. I never took them for granted. And I knew about all those little sacrifices they made. Also, I wouldn't have to do without. They know. I've, I've read about how people look when they die in space. But I, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything to die for. Please, I know you didn't. I know you didn't, and I know you're not to blame, and I'm sorry. Do you understand me? I am so sorry. <sighs> I'll be okay. Signal transmission from G2. Jerry? It's Jerry.
Cross here, what is it? EDS, come in. Gerald Cross here. Jerry? I wanted to see you. <laughs> Marilyn? Is that you? What are you doing on an EDS? I wanted to see you, Jerry, so I hid on the ship. You hid? The stowaway. I didn't know what it would mean. Oh, Marilyn, what have you done? I didn't mean to hurt you, Jerry. I just wanted to see I'm sorry. You. Don't, don't cry, sis. I didn't mean it to sound that way. It's just that it's unfair. It's because of me. Don't feel like that, Jerry. <laughs> Don't let me go knowing you feel like that. EDS, have you called Stardust? Is there anything? There's nothing he can do, Jerry. He tried everything. No one can help me now, I know that. I just wanted to say goodbye, Jerry. The planet's starting to swing. We're losing contact with the base now. Jerry, you're fading away, so I have to say goodbye now. But maybe we'll see each other again. I'll be nothing you can see, but I'll be there. Always think of me like that. Always. Always like that. Never any other way. <laughs> goodbye, Jerry. I love you. Supply insufficient for mission completion at present mass. Condition red. Mission status in jeopardy. Condition red. I'm ready. In the darkness, Thomas Barton hurtles towards his destination with the realization that there is room for emotion on the wilder frontiers of the universe. Emotion and the memory of a girl who had not known that sometimes it takes a human life to balance a cold equation in the black geometry of the Twilight Zone. Oh. 
Oh, boy. <laughs> he really lucked out this time. Mm-hmm. We most certainly did. Oh, got it. Come on. <laughs> Girls, don't go too far away. We're going to eat soon. Yeah, all right. You happy? Oh. Gracious, you'd think you'd never seen food before. <laughs> you okay, honey? Yes. I guess so. It's the strangest thing. You okay, honey? You just asked me that. You okay, honey? Why do you keep saying that? Saying what? You keep asking me if I'm okay. I only said it once. No, you said it three times. <laughs> Here. I think you need this. A toast to our new house, my rays, and the beautiful and gorgeous day. Hey, where's our drinks? Mm. I'll get them for you. Drinks. One drinks. Two drinks. Get them open. Come on. Let's have a toast. Hey, where's our drinks? I'll get them for you. Drinks. One drinks. Toast. Do I new house? My, my, my raise. And then this is beautiful and then go to just stay. Huh? Yeah. I think you need the digest. The toast. <laughs> to our new house. My race. And this is beautiful.
When are they gonna get these things to work right? Don't they realize they're screwing with people's brains? Okay, lady, just settle back. Everything's okay. You still got six minutes left. Six minutes? What are you talking about? Now, just before you came out of it, were things like uh, repeating? Yes, they were, yeah. Yeah, I think I know what it is. No, this is reality, lady. That picnic and family stuff, that's the dream. Look. Now you just hold still a minute and I'll get you back there for your last six minutes, okay? But then you gotta go back to work. Now just settle back. Take it easy, okay? Well, that ought to do it. Okay, lady. Back you go. Nice news. this dream. It was... It's fading so fast. I was... some kind of worker in a... factory in the future. Oh. Oh. I can't explain it. I tried to cut the power, but the isolator wouldn't trip. It wouldn't make any difference. Too late for this one anyway. I'm so glad I'm back. So am I. I love you. I love you too. Can I stay here with you? Forever? Yes. Stay with me here. Forever. This should not happen. Mitchell Chaplin? Answer him. Yes, I'm Mitchell Chaplin. You've been found guilty of the crime of coldness, of not opening your emotions to your fellow citizens. During your trial, this court heard from members of your family, as well as citizens from your place of work. All offered testimony to your lack of caring and concern for others. You were present when such testimony was given and heard all who spoke against you, did you not? I did. Have you anything to add? No, nothing. That being the case, Mitchell Chaplin, this court having weighed all facts placed before it and having found you guilty of the crime of coldness, 
hereby sentences you to one year of invisibility. You are crazy if you think a year's invisibility is going to bother me. You speak only when spoken to, and then only with respect. This court stands adjourned. That's it? Huh? That's all? That didn't even hurt. So now I'm invisible, right? Hmm? As far as you're concerned, I don't exist? Big deal. <laughs> I could do a year of this on a pogo stick. This is nothing to me. Nothing to me. It's a world much like our own, yet much unlike it. A twisted mirror of reality in which a man can find himself cast out, made invisible by public acclamation, belonging no longer to society, but only to the gray reaches of the Twilight Zone. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Finally, just came back to clean out my desk here. Very nice talking to you, too. Hey, tell old man Richter that I'll be back at work in about a year, OK? And listen, while I'm gone, I hope you don't mind taking care of my accounts for me. Thank you. I'll have the uh, roast. I said I'll have the roast. Can I help you, ma'am? Yes, I think I'll try the stew, please. Uh, of course. Look, I don't want to be a bother. Really? So, I'll just uh, serve myself, OK? I think I will have the roast, huh? like I said. And maybe a little bit of stew. And, uh, OK, OK, I'll have a piece of chicken. A thigh, I think. <laughs> a thigh, I think. I like that. How's the vegetables today? You know, maybe not. Looks like it's been there a few days. And potatoes. Definitely some potatoes. You don't mind if I sit here, do you? No, of course you don't. That's my mommy's place. But there's an empty seat over there.
Good evening. Good evening. How are you this evening? Good. Good. Now, this being a private spa, I know that you need proper identification to enter. So, this will do, won't it? <laughs> Thanks. Hiya. Anybody sitting at this table? Um, yes. Oh. You don't mind if I join you? Uh, no. Um, of course not. Please. Oh. You're kind. You're kind. You're, you're too kind. Uh, huh. Well. My name is Gersh. Bennett Gersh, <clears throat> Chaplin. Mitchell, Chaplin. Mitchell, <clears throat> Chaplin. Huh? You sound as if you have a little bit of a cold. Comes and goes. You have to forgive me. Oh, I forgive you. I forgive you. Ah. Uh, oh, yes. You're, you're having that ham and bean soup, aren't you? Yes. Mm. Yes, I am. Would you like some? Oh, no, no, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't, unless, unless, of course, you insisted. Well, then, <clears throat> I insist. Oh, <laughs> you are kind, you are kind. Sir, I know you have to pretend you don't hear me, but I just wanted you to know that I'm not going to cause any trouble here tonight. I am not going to be disruptive in any way. I'm here because I always wanted to come here and I could never afford it. And, well, I'm celebrating tonight. Six months of invisibility. I'm halfway there. Another six months and it's over. So I just wanted to come somewhere special to celebrate. I hope you understand. Ah, Mr. and Mrs. Scoville. So pleased you could be with us this evening. 
Please, your table is right this way. I'll be no problem. I promise. <laughs> Oh, he'd come up into our room and he'd yell at us, hey, what is going on up here? What is this, some kind of a playground? Then he'd talk to us in staccato like we were stupid. Now knock it off! Or he'd say, you know, I've been up here twi twice already, and if I have to come up here again, you are going to be sorry. We'd be thinking, you know, we weren't real thrilled with this visit, Dad. And he'd always want to involve us in the punishment. What, do I have to get the belt? Oh, no, let's get that shovel with the nails through it today. <laughs> My mother didn't hit us. She knew she couldn't hurt us. She had too much fun saving it for him. She'd say, no, you will be punished. But I don't think I'm going to punish you right now. Do you know why? Because I think someone will be very interested in hearing about this when he gets home from work. <laughs> He'd come in the door. She'd start right in. I have had it with this one. I have eight more just like him around the house all day long, and I'll be crazy to put up with this foolishness for one more minute. He'd look at you and say, what is wrong with you? <laughs> I'm under a lot of stress. Is everything she's telling me true? <laughs> no, she's a liar. <laughs> and she's been drinking all day. Please. Look, no one can hear us here. We, we could talk. My name's... Hey, please, don't be afraid. Just talk to me. I have to talk to someone. I'll risk another year of invisibility if I can just talk to someone, just for a minute. Please, look, you know what it's like. Please, talk to me. Please. Talk to me. I got it now. All right, pop it. Pop it. Pop it. That's it. Please, there's a hell of a lot of pain. We'll send someone to you right away. If you'll raise your head, please, sir, I'll get face print identification to access your main medical file. I can't, but my name is Chaplin. Mitchell Chaplin. I'm sorry, sir, but the only way I can access your file is through face print identification.
today? <coughs> it's been a year? I mean, I didn't know. <coughs> I didn't know. I mean, well, I stopped counting. Hello, citizen. <sighs> Doesn't even leave a scar. Well, of course not. You've paid your debt to society. Let us take you out for a drink. Oh, no, thanks. I think I'd really rather just... It's tradition. Oh, well, oh, okay. In that case, I really, I don't want to be unsociable. I gave him a call. I took the tone you suggested. And I think he's coming home, at least for a while. Wonderful. I would really like to meet him sometime. Oh, I want him to meet you. Mitch. Look, all of us at the office know I mean, we all know where you've been for the last year, and we know how rough it's been. But, oh, please take this the right way. They really helped you. I mean, you are a wonderful person now. You care. Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I will see you tomorrow, OK? Hello. Remember me? Please don't turn away. Talk to me. Say anything. Say... I'm here. I exist. How can you do this? How can you treat me like this when you know? Can't you take pity on me? How can you be so cold? are not invisible. I see you. I see you. Citizen. I'm right here. You are here by order. You see and I care. activity immediately. You are in I violation care. of citizen's law. Two, four, eight, two, four. The penalty for such activity is no less than one year of invisibility. You are hereby ordered a violation of citizen. A small footnote found in the court records of some parallel world, the name of Mitchell Chaplin, who served his sentence of invisibility and learned his lesson well, too well. This time, however, he will wear his invisibility like a shield of glory, a shield forged in the very heart of the Twilight Zone. A city hospital, 8 p.m. An unexpected visitor has just arrived, bearing unwelcome tidings. A disease so new the textbooks haven't recorded it. This, then, is its first case history, documented from the medical files of the Twilight Zone. I'm Nurse Hendricks. May I help you? It's my eyes. I, 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 I need to see the doctor. Get Dr. Peterson. Here, let me take a look. Uh, no, I... Please, we can't help you if we don't know no, what's I, wrong with you. No, don't you touch me. I'll, I'll show the doctor. Uh, get me the doctor. 
immediately. Name? Uh, Jean Reed, Mrs. Jean Reed. Address? 1705 Fairmont Street. Please, where is the doctor? I've got to see him. Dr. Peterson is on his way. Please, take a seat. Uh, no, here. no, there, there isn't much time. Oh, oh God. No, it's too late. What's too late? Don't you understand? I can't see. I'm blind. Let me see. Come with us, please. There must be something you can do. I'm sorry. If you try the clinic, maybe. The clinic's full. My wife, she hasn't been well. She's trying to hide it, but I think maybe it's her heart. All we need is somebody to look at her. Maybe a day or two in here. Mr. Wells, without medical insurance or some guarantee of payment, we simply cannot admit her. I'm sorry. It's hospital policy. There's nothing I can do. Must be her. What kind of a hospital is this? Aren't you supposed to look after sick people? I couldn't help overhearing. You all right? I'm fine. It's not my decision. It's hospital policy. I think people would understand that. Hendricks, Mrs. Reed is asking for you. She says she has to talk to you. She was quite insistent. You wanted to see me, Mrs. Reed? Yes. Hello. Well, won't you sit down, please? I have a great deal of work to do, Mrs. Reed. I have something to tell you. Sit down, please. Dr. Robbins. Calling Dr. Robbins. Mrs. Hendricks, we're alike, I think. You and I. Mrs. Reed, I don't even know you, and I don't think you know me. Uh, no, but I, I sense that we're alike. We are two of a kind. Mrs. Reed, shouldn't you be sleeping? You're changing the subject, of course. I know because I used to do the same thing. It's Easier, isn't it? Prescribe a pill, suggest a nap, anything so you don't have to think about a person or talk to them. A am I right? Sleep is the best thing for you. Dr. Friedman will be in at 9. He's our chief of staff and one of the finest eye specialists in the country. You'll feel much better after he talks to you. Oh, I feel all right now, Mrs. Hendricks. It's you I'm worried about. It's very kind of you. I get some rest. Look, I don't care what your figures show. My phone bill is wrong. Yes. No, it's not. It's $50 higher than it should be. Well, computers make mistakes. No, I don't want to hold. You look like you need a vacation, Claire. It's just the way people treat you sometimes. You want to... Never mind. What can I do for you? You talked to Mrs. Reed yesterday. Did she say anything about her family? Her husband? Not that I recall. Why? He's here. Did he come in about his wife? No, he didn't even know she was here. Emergency picked up the call about an hour ago. He was calling for help. An ambulance just brought him in. He's gone blind, Claire, without apparent cause. It's contagious? He claims he's had it since last night. If it's contagious, she picked it up from him. But if she knew... Knew, I left him there and came in here to save herself. He says he begged her not to leave him. He must have passed out. Fear, I guess. When he came to, she was gone. He crawled around the house until he could find a telephone. It's hard to believe. When she 
came in here, she knew exactly what was happening. She must have seen it happen. It's Dr. Peterson. Do you have any news? What's causing this? I'm afraid we don't know yet. Then leave me alone. Mr. Reed, I'm Nurse Hendricks. Would you like to be in a room with your wife? We can arrange it. I wouldn't share her air if it was the last oxygen on this planet. Do you have any idea what it's like to wake up blind, alone, calling for someone over and over who isn't there, realizing that you've been abandoned? Or to you, or to anyone, until somebody can tell me they found a cure. Leave me alone. I don't care what happens to her. Don't you understand? I don't care. There you are. You both better come downstairs. All hell's breaking loose. Dr. Henderson. I have to see a doctor immediately. I'm sorry, sir. There are other people ahead of you. No, but you don't understand. I have to see a doctor, please. Who's in charge here? This is an emergency. Wait your turn. You're just, just the same as everybody else here. Who do you think you are? Go to the end of the line. I can't see anything. Please. Wait your turn. Go to the end of the line. Come and help me, please. Go to the end of the line. I can't see. I'm right here. It's all right. I was, I was at, I was at work. I. Not really sure what happened. Blind. They're all blind. Stone blind, we used to call it. But blindness is not new. This is. This growth, this ocular window shade is utterly beyond my experience. I've been informed that the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta has put out a full alert and that the Surgeon General has convened an emergency meeting in Washington with some of our top physicians. Any delay in responding to this could cost us dearly. Agreed. Is there any clue to the origin of the disease? I've had Dr. Gordon in constant touch with Atlanta on that very subject. He went home for a fast shower and change of clothes. He should have been back by now. Dr. Gordon came in an hour ago. He's blind. My God. We've had reports of an estimated 500 cases in New York City. Los Angeles is running about the same. It seems we have an epidemic on our hands. What about the press? Not being very helpful, are they? From some of the reports I've read, unless we find something constructive to say soon, we'll have a full-blown panic on our hands. People are scared. There must be something we can do. There is, and we are. But this is the difficult part waiting for someone to come up with a cause. Once we have that, we can proceed. Until then, all we can do is keep running tests and wait. When did you last get some sleep? I don't know. Then go home, get some rest. Consider that an order. You too, Eddie. I need my staff alert and clear-headed, understand? All right, but I'll be back for my regular shift tonight. Ditto. Glad you come to see me. Please sit down. You must be exhausted. The others were talking about you, how hard you work. They call you a dedicated woman. Is that what they call me? Dedicated? Yes, they used to call me that too. I was very businesslike. Nothing bothered me. Why did you come to visit me? I don't know. I was on my way home. Yes. Normally, you don't visit much, do you? The other nurses mentioned that, too. Is it because you sense it, too, that we're two of a kind, you and I? I should let you get some sleep. Look, I know what's happening to us. I know how it's happening, and I know why it's happening. Would you like to hear 
Claire. Yes? It's because we're monkeys. Remember, see no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil. We used to be courteous, didn't we? We used to care, we used to rise up in outrage if someone was in pain or abused or unsheltered. But now, don't you see? We, we've cut ourselves off from so much. We refuse to see what's going on around us. We turn a blind eye to the pain. Now it's catching up with us. Now it truly is a blind eye. It's preposterous. Is it? I heard your husband went blind first. And you abandoned him. Is that true? He just gotten a call that his mother died. They were very close. When he heard, it was like someone discussing the weather. That's when he became a monkey. And I ran. Yes, I ran to save myself. Now I'm a monkey, too. This new growth is irritated and inflamed. The ocular muscles are functioning normally, though, which leads us to believe the eye itself is undamaged, though shuttered away beneath a curtain of flesh. There is a chance that surgery can remove this flesh curtain without injuring the eye, but we won't know for certain until we try it. There's still no news from Atlanta on possible causes? They may have a theory, but they're being pretty tight-lipped about it until they can confirm. They estimate that at the present rate, the number of those afflicted could reach 100,000 by week's end. What about the issue of quarantine? I can confirm that it's being discussed, but that's all. Because there's always a chance that it may not be a disease at all, but some sort of latent mutation triggered by some change in the environment. Well, it's got 100 arms, 100 legs, 50 heads, and no eyes. The south wing of the hospital. Could I have your attention? I have just received a fax from Washington. At 1,700 hours on the 10th of April, that would be only hours before the first case was discovered, an explosion was reported at a top-secret biological research lab in Alaska. It is presumed that certain unstable forms of bacteria may have been released into the atmosphere. It is estimated that their effects could be unpredictable. It is fairly certain that the bacteria released cannot survive long outside the laboratory. Well, I suggest we adjourn. you were going home. I was, but there's no reason to go home. Jim and I have separated. We moved out. I'm sorry, I didn't know. Nothing acrimonious. It's all very calm and sensible. We just stopped connecting. We led our separate lives like two strangers just sharing the same space. No connection, no involvement, just lost in our indifference. I came in here tonight, I started thinking about me, about all of us. She's right, Eddie. We're monkeys. Claire, you're not making any sense. Do you know, I can't remember the last time I looked a patient in the eye. Somewhere along the line, I stopped treating them as individuals. They're just numbers to me. They don't have life stories. They have charts. I'm no different than you. But you are. Uh, look, you're an excellent nurse. It's just part of the job. 
And isn't that a fine excuse? Isn't that a comfortable bandage on our diminished humanity? The phone company overcharges us. There's nothing they can do about it. We turn sick people away because they don't have the right insurance. It's just part of the job. So we lie to ourselves and cut ourselves off further and further because there's so much pain in the world. Claire, you were in the meeting with us. You heard the reports from Washington just as I did. We know what the cause is now, without a shadow of a doubt. If you keep chasing this around and around in your head, but you're just... There's something happening, Eddie. That report doesn't explain why only some people are susceptible and some aren't. What does it say in the Bible? If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. Stop it. You're upset. This has all been a terrible strain on all of us. What you need to do is go home. Get some sleep. Yes, I'm sure that'll solve everything. Good night, Eddie. Peterson will play guide dog for a while. How's Claire? She's the same. No vision. None at all? No, I'm afraid. Mrs. Reed, good. I was hoping to see you. It's Dr. Peterson here. Yes. I was wondering if you could drop by Mrs. Hendricks' room. Maybe help cheer her up a little bit. She thinks a lot of you. Of course, I, I, I'd be glad to. Hendricks, it's me, Jean. Can I can I visit for a while? Of course. Well, isn't it exciting? We're going to see you again. Operation works. Twenty out of twenty successful in L.A. Doctor Friedman's getting his this afternoon, and I'm tomorrow. And you? When are they planning to operate on you? They're not. They're what? The operation isn't really the answer. You said it yourself, remember? You're right. Well, no, but it, it, that was before we knew about the bacteria, before so we... So, now we have an easy answer. Solid and uncomplicated. But it won't last. It'll happen again. And they'll come up with something else. But what happens when we run out of solutions? Easy answers. It's time to go now, Mrs. Reed. Wait, Dr. Peterson. Aren't they going to operate on Mrs. Hendricks? No. An operation isn't the answer in her case. Well, then how will she ever see again? She'll see again, Mrs. Reed. It'll just take her a little longer. Enigma, draped in hospital sheets and self-imposed darkness, with the added sobering thought that Claire Hendricks is perfectly correct in her own diagnosis. Take it as a warning, a cry for humanity, or a simple plea for responsibility from the dark places of the Twilight Zone. This is absurd. 
We have no assurance that this so-called emissary is not hostile. But the radio message said he was an ambassador. How many ambassadors have preceded invasion in our own Earth history? The United States would do well to follow Soviet lead in uh, placing their troops on alert. For God's sake, this is the first contact humanity has had with extraterrestrial intelligence. Do you want them to think we're savages? Thinking with our guns instead of... People of the Earth attend my words. Two million years ago, my people began a vast seeding program. We sped up evolution on several thousand planets, bringing forth life where there had been none. Your Earth was one such planet. In a sense, you are our children. And like watchful parents, we've kept an eye on you. But you have not come far enough. We see that you have a small talent for war. We've seen your primitive conflicts, your crude weapons, your petty bickering over borders, and the nuclear balance of terror, which precludes any real victory and we despair. We bred you for finer things, and you have failed miserably to produce the potential we nurtured in you so long ago. And so the experiment is over. Within a day, our armada will be in position around your Earth. At that time, all life on your planet will be destroyed. <laughs> It's absurd. How do we know you can't do it? If you really need a demonstration, um, keep watching the skies. Order! Madam Chairman. Madam Chairman. The chair recognizes the delegate from the United States. Mr. Ambassador, surely you don't mean to condemn our race to death without giving us a chance to speak in our own defense. Surely that's not fair. The universe, Mr. Fraser, is not fair. Do you think we made this decision in haste? We've been debating it for many centuries. Centuries? Oh, yes. We are a very long-lived and patient people, but even our patience has limits. You must give us one more chance. <sighs> You've had your chance, many of them, over the centuries. Yes, yes, that's true, Mr. Ambassador, it's true, but... We've never had this much motivation. You say what? Your ships are arriving in, in, a, in a day. Give us that much time, one day. What do you think you can accomplish in so short a time? I don't know, but you must give us one chance. At least let us show you the potential you saw in us at the dawn of time. Very well, Mr. Fraser. you have your day. 24 hours. Until then... Order! Please, 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 if ever there was a time for us to put aside our differences, it is now. I am not convinced. Before we enter into peace negotiation, I must have proof that this uh, threat is real. Proof? Proof? You've seen their spaceships. You just now saw him disappear. What else do you want? Excuse me. The Royal Observatory in Greenwich. They say it's urgent. He said keep watching the skies. Halley's Comet. It's gone. We've got to find everything we can. Disarmament. Aid conferences. League of Nations, World Court, Salt Treaty. Sure, everything that's never worked before, why should it work this time? Damn it, we don't have time to start from scratch. It'll work. Because it has to work. Yes, there it is. The awesome ship has returned exactly 24 hours since it disappeared yesterday. 
but we have confirmation from UN sources that an historic accord right. has been reached right. among the 15 members of the Security Council and approved by acclamation of the General Assembly. There is today total peace among the peoples of the earth for the very first time. Good luck to us, my friends. Good luck to us all. Well, Mr. Fraser, what have you there? Peace, Mr. Ambassador. Peace. Within these pages lies the framework for worldwide unilateral disarmament. <laughs> we, the people of the Earth, have at last made common cause against our own primitive savagery. <laughs> I feel you have misunderstood me. <laughs> Your savagery is an issue, that's true, but... <laughs> You see, on the thousands of planets under our control, we breed warriors, gentlemen, warriors to fight for us across the galaxy. In your case, your savagery has not bred true. You are woefully backwards in the art of war. You fight erratically and clumsily. Your weapons are shockingly crude. And worst of all, in your hearts, you long for peace. A small talent for war. Too small, too small to be of any use to us. There's no matter, we'll just have to try again elsewhere. But I thank you for a most amusing day. You people have a delightful sense of the absurd. You might take some comfort in that. After all, as one of your fine earth actors, Edmund Gwynn, once said, dying is easy. Comedy's heart. If we are pawns of dark powers, then even our highest aspirations become a grim joke. But if not, then no one will goad us toward world peace or take it away once we've achieved it. Doubters, please note, you've just seen it achieved once, however briefly, in the Twilight Zone. <gasps> Mr. Foreman? Mr. Foreman? Mr. Foreman. Don't try to talk. Here, drink this. How long? Oh, oh. Well, let's see. Um... Our records show that you were put into cold sleep in June 2023, is that right? Right. June 18th. Can I get you some wine? You know, I... Cut I... to the chase, please, doctor. Pardon? The punchline. Mr. Foreman, you've been asleep approximately 324 years. I don't understand. Why was I brought way out here? Why wasn't I taken to a city? Look, I know this is all coming very hard and fast for you, but you have to realize there are no cities, not like you remember them. There are no cities or freeways or factories. Come on. It can't all be like this. 300 years and so little progress. I 
you'll lie down on the operating table, Mr. Foreman, we can begin the operation right away. Right away? What are you talking about? Where are your instruments, your IVs? Look, it probably isn't even sterile in here. You must trust me. We are here to help, not harm you. You have my word on it. No pain, Mr. Foreman. You'll feel no pain at all. I'll take the pain for you. Sarah? Adenocarcinomas, three of them. The first is 2.3 centimeters at the tip of the antrum where it connects with the pyloric canal. Can you see it? Yes, I see it. We'll take that one first. I can change the molecular density of my hand so that it's out of phase with normal matter. I can do the same to anything that I touch. Irene, can you give me a closer scan of the tip of the pylorus, please? There we are. Prepare for excision. Three hundred years and so little progress. There's no harm done. Some sort of bioluminescent organisms, like fireflies? Those are their antecedents, many generations removed. I'm very sorry for what I said earlier. I just assumed. Well, I don't know what I assumed. But I was wrong. And I would like to thank you for, for saving my life. Our technology is a kind of biological gestalt. All of us, at some level, are interconnected with it. Like the psychic surgery you performed on me. Eye phase. Irene's a scanner. John's an empath. Joshua coordinates the psi links among the genetically structured organisms in the settlement. I build machines. Planes, tanks, satellites, computers. Where do I fit into your little biological gestalt? Why bother to even wake me up? I was under the impression your little utopia had eliminated war. We can answer all your questions in our computer room. Would you come with me?
My God. Primates, chimpanzees, orangutans are the most receptive to genetic surgery. Their brains can be maximized by a factor of 20. Each performs a specific computer function. Sorting, cataloging, interfacing. All knowledge is stored in here and available to all. What have you done to the poor things? No one's done anything to them, not against their will. When they're young, one of our scanners makes a psi link and shows them the choices open to them. Some of them choose a normal existence, others choose knowledge. They are the caretakers of our thoughts, and their world is a much larger one than any one of us could ever hope to have. I'll never understand this, any of it. Why did you bring me here? Just to see this? Three weeks ago, our scanners picked up an image from deep space. That image is stored here. Just open your mind to it. Create a, a pause, a space between thoughts. Let the image take that space. According to its trajectory, it'll hit somewhere on the Indian subcontinent. The result, disastrous earthquakes, tidal waves, Terrible climactic changes for the entire planet. What can I do about that? Several of the particle beam satellites you designed are still in Earth's orbit. Still probably operational, if you can reestablish telemetry with them. Yes. Shatter the meteor while it's in space, and the smaller pieces will burn up on entry into the atmosphere. Yes, I can. Wait a minute. If you hadn't needed me, would I still be on ice in some damn vault two miles underground? Probably so. Of all the self. Matthew, no, you don't understand. This is why we couldn't risk bringing you out otherwise. It happened 20 years after you were put in cold sleep. A limited exchange, they called it. Only six missiles fired by each side but sufficient to wipe out 80% of the world's population. 300 years later, less than 200,000 human beings on the face of the earth. Machines, Mr. Foreman. We put all our trust in them, but no more. Each of us is a part of our technology. Each of us has a say in our own destiny. We'll never let technology do to our world what it did to yours. Some of these electronics components you people dug up are over three and a half centuries old. I can't guarantee how long we'll transmit before the system crashes. Well, once one of the scanners gives you the coordinates, you won't need to transmit for very long. Okay. Let's see if there's anything up there to activate. Sir, would you hand me that light pin? God's sake, it's just a pin. You have no idea what it's like for us, sifting through those old buildings. I know. I'm sorry I snapped at you. Something's up there. It's demodulating a carrier signal. It's demultiplexing the subcarrier. We're getting individual telemetry from one. Now, two of the satellites. Solar battery, still operational. Radar tracking system, operational. Particle beam generator, operational. I think I'll have that drink now you offered me a few days ago. I can't remember ever seeing so many stars before. The sky only started to clear up about a hundred years ago. Until then, the nuclear winter took 50% of our light. We had to make do with bioluminescence. They seem so close, you can almost touch them. That's why I started in aerospace to begin with. Someday, I thought, we'll be up there among the stars. And I wanted, well, I wanted to help us get there. Wanted to get there myself too, I guess. But you built missiles and bombs instead. You do it.
because you convince yourself that it's necessary. You do it because it makes you feel important. You do it for the money. Lots of reasons. None of them any good. Don't your people ever regret, Sarah? The humankind will never reach the stars now. Your technology, you can't. I mean, you can't build organic spacecraft, can you? We explore space with our minds, Matthew, as easily as you ever did with your machines. Our astral bodies have walked on a thousand planets, worlds so inhospitable to human life that your spacecraft couldn't even have landed there. I'm sorry. Just an old fool with old ideas. No, you're just a man adjusting to a new world and new ideas. No. I'll never fit in here, Sarah. I'll never be able to do with my mind what you do with Yes, you can. Matthew, we can perform psionic surgery on you, give you the same abilities that we have. You'll be able to explore worlds that you've never even dreamt of. It's more than that. You have a common history, a common bond. I'll never be able to share in that. You've built a new world out of the ruins of the old. I'm part of the old, part of madness that destroyed it. I'll never belong here, Sarah. It's coming in on a heading of four hours, 30 minutes, 20 seconds declination. Five hours, 18 minutes, nine seconds right ascension. Presently at a distance of 14,000 kilometers from Earth. It's entering the tracking range of the satellite now. The onboard radar is locked onto the target. Particle beam generator will activate at a distance of 9,400 kilometers from Earth. All set. All we have to do now is sit back and watch what happens and hope the particle beam carves up the meteor on the first try. You said it was locked on target. Is there any way for it to be unlocked? Only from here, as long as the radio link holds out. We owe you a debt of gratitude, Matthew, for what you've done. It isn't over yet. 12,600 kilometers from Earth. What the? I don't. Something wrong, Mr. Foreman? The media. It seems to be decreasing incrementally as it approaches Earth. It's almost as though it's decelerating. And it seems to be altering its trajectory, as though preparing for orbital insertion. This is insane. Meteors don't make bloody course corrections. They don't decelerate, and they don't. My God. What an idiot I've been. You're telepaths. You can put any damned image in my mind you want to. What the hell is it out there you don't want me to see? What is it you want me to shoot down? Mr. Fullman. What is it? Tell me. Irene, show him. He'll find out eventually, Joshua. It might as well be now. Oh, my God. What the hell do you think you're doing? Those are my people up there! No, Mr. Foreman, they're not. They're the worst of your people. When the war started, the ship was being prepared. People were being mobilized. A thousand people, military, politicians, the ones who started the war. They were planning their escape. There are. No. The time dilation effect, don't you see? Time slowed down for no. them. 300 years was like five or ten. They thought they could come back when the radiation died down. You're lying. They no. wouldn't have done it. They did. No. They did, Mr. Foreman. You're lying. They did, Mr. Foreman. No. They did. No. <laughs> I'm sorry, Matthew. I 
would have brought it all back. The missiles, the madness. They were carrying weapons, nuclear weapons on that ship. I don't believe you. I don't. My God, no. 9,390 kilometers from Earth. Satellite locking on target. a nuclear explosion. We did have weapons on board. My God. What have I done? You saved us, Matthew. Saved us from a madness and infection. A thousand people. A thousand criminals. You were an instrument of justice, Mr. Foreman. That's all. But what about me? Now that I've done your dirty work, am I an infection too? Do I die also? Or do you just put me in cold sleep? In quarantine? No. Of course not. You're one of us now. One of you? How? What do we have in common? Guilt. You share our guilt in what we did today. What we had to do. Would you like to see them up close? I don't think I deserve to. As Sarah said, Mr. Foreman, you're one of us now. You deserve to be a part of what we are. I'm sorry. I can't. Stop. <laughs> Welcome home, Mr. Foreman. Welcome home. In his mind, he starts to hear a song. A song of alien thought speaking without voice, welcoming him. Matthew Foreman, once a sleeper standing outside time, has found his place at last. A voyager touching the farthest shores of the Twilight Zone.